Welcome back to an introduction to oceanography and chapter 11 of the essentials of oceanography. In chapter 11, we are going to be talking about the coastline, coastal processes, the things that happen along the coast and why they happen. So main concepts in this chapter, the location of the coast depends primarily on global tectonic activity and the ocean's volume of water. That determines sea level and where the coast may be at any given point in geologic time. The shape of the coast is a product of many processes, including uplift and subsidence, the wearing down of land by erosion, the redistribution of materials by sediment transport, and deposition. Coasts are classified as erosional or depositional coast. Beaches change shape and volume as a function of wave energy and the balance of sediment input and removal and human interference with coastal processes has generally accelerated the erosion of coasts near inhabited areas. All right, how are coastlines shaped? Well, they are shaped by marine and terrestrial processes, not only what's happening with the ocean, but what's happening with land as well. Coasts are affected by erosion. Of course, that's the movement away of sediment and deposition, the deposition or the placing of sediment and also sea level change. And sea level, as we have learned, has changed over all of geologic time. Uh, the thinking at this time is that generally on a global scale, sea level is increasing. And we can see looking at different proxy uh, data that sea level has been increasing for about the last 10 to 11,000 years since the last ice age, the Wisconsin ice age ended. Erosional coasts Dominate, uh, dominant processes remove material and depositional coasts, the dominant processes add sediment. And we talk about static change, or again, that, that concept of isostasy or isostatic rebound in that, that continents move up and down based on how much mass is in the continent. If more is added to the continent, it sinks and maybe sea level rises. If uh, mass is taken away from the continent, it may rise and sea level drops. So those eustatic changes variations in sea level that affect coasts and the bordering seabed. So the shape of the coast is a process, uh, is a function of the processes of uplift and subsidence, erosion, transportation, and deposition. Long-term changes in sea level, local changes can come from tectonic motions and isostatic adjustment. There's also some uh, coastal changes that can occur because of winds and currents and those eustatic variations that can be measured worldwide, meaning what is the sea level based on glaciation. Is there more ice locked up on the ice sheets and therefore less water in the ocean? Uh, the volume of a basin can uh, vary due to sediment accumulation and also it can vary due to seafloor spreading. And we also see changes in water volume due to uh, thermo expansion, meaning a warmer sea surface is going to be thicker and a colder sea surface is going to be thinner. So all of these different processes at a global and at a local scale can change the shape of a coastline over geologic time. So let's talk about sea levels. What we have uh, known is that, again, essentially sea levels have been on the rise for the last 10 to 11, maybe 12,000 uh, years in a significant way. Sea levels past and future. Sea level rose rapidly at the end of the last ice age as glaciers and ice caps melted and water returned to the ocean. The rate of rise has slowed over the last 4,000 years, is now believed to be somewhere between 1 and 2.4 millimeters per year, although I can tell you that in the last perhaps uh, decade, since about 1992, uh, a real attention has been paid to sea level rise, and we're beginning to see uh, from satellite altimetry and then also from just from tide gauges that sea level rise being closer to 3, 3.5 millimeters per year. So projections of sea level through the year 2100, and again, you see numerous projections because there's numerous different models, but those projections, um, seven different groups, have estimated future sea levels based on historical observation and climate models, and, and even the most conservative of these shows a 20 centimeter or 8 inch rise. Um, some of the less conservative show uh, a rise more on the order of two feet, so significant rises, and again, new data over the last 10 to 20 years has really begun to see significant uh, potential increases in sea level and mainly from from two things the melting of the ice sheets and then also that thermal expansion of the ocean as it does warm up and so we know looking at different types of sediments and deposits and cores 
that the southern coastline of the U.S. looked a lot different 18,000 years ago. Uh, the Florida Peninsula was much, much wider, uh, and it changed the climate. And this 18,000-year-ago this, uh, view was because lower sea levels were in place due to the fact that most of the water was locked up in the ice sheets. So because of lowering sea level, the position of the gently sloping coast had been as much as 125 miles further out to sea from the present shoreline, which meant that much of the continental shelf was actually exposed. Now, if sea level continues to rise in the distant future, Florida could look something more like what you see in the bottom picture. But I will tell you that when we look at uh, sea levels in the deep past, we know that at times Florida was almost completely inundated or was completely underwater, and then at other times it was this very wide, broad uh, peninsula. So there's been a lot of fluctuation and what the state of Florida has looked like over the last 200 million years. So how do we classify coastlines? They're classified based on the predominant events occurring at that coast. Again, I've talked many times that science is all about classification, putting things in distinct groups. So erosional coasts are new coasts in which the dominant process is erosion which exceeds deposition. All right, more erosion is occurring than deposition. They tend to be rocky, and, and oftentimes um, they also uh, to be, tend to be uh, coasts that are seeing a lot of uplift. Depositional coasts are steady state, or sometimes they're growing because the rate of sediment accumulation uh, is more than what's taken away, and sometimes it's also the actions of living organisms like coral. So you have a depositional coast in the picture where it's sandy and erosional coast where it's rocky. The inevitable process of erosion will tend to change the character of any coast from erosional. So it starts out with uplift and erosion and rockiness, but eventually all that wave action will eventually uh, change the character of any coast from erosional to depositional. So what are the causes of erosion? There's erosions from uh, streams that flow in from the mountains, abrasion of wind, uh, there's alternate and freezing and thawing of uh, alternate freezing and thawing of water and rock cracks that helps to break up rock. Uh, plant roots can uh, weather and break down rock. Glacial activity can create erosion. Rainfall can create erosion. Uh, dissolution of acids from the soil, which includes sinking and settling. Lots and lots of ways that you can uh, that that rock can be broken down by weathering and then eroded. Now, much more detail is given to this concept in an earth science class, and and as part of your science curriculum you may want to consider taking an earth science class and talking more about erosion and deposition and how it works. So high energy coasts are battered by large waves. High energy coasts tend to have sea cliffs and sea caves and sea stacks and wave cut platforms. Eventually, even those high energy coasts uh, begin to be straightened out and also uh, changed into less high energy coasts and more into depositional coasts um, as uh, selective erosion occurs and literally what can be rocky and jagged coastlines can be straightened out over many many thousands or maybe uh, hundreds of thousands or close to millions of years. So here's your erosional coast at low tide. You've got your sea arches, your sea caves, your big cliffs, your sea cliffs, your sea stacks um, and as that water moves up um, it, it erodes and breaks away the sea cliff, and what ends up happening is uh, below the uh, level of the water, you get these wave-cut platforms. So um, the wave-cut platform is going to be very, very flat. Wave erosion of a sea cliff produces a shelf-life wave-cut platform, and typically it's only going to be visible at your low tides. So here's the result of, of a wave action on a coast. You see these deep sea cliffs and that wave-cut platform, that's what you see between the two cliffs, that flat, like, table-like structure there, that is a wave-cut platform. Uh, that's Tasmania, which is, of course, the island south of Australia, uh, and this, is, of course, is going to be at low tide. All right, here's another uh, sea stacks. This is another thing where um, selective erosion or just differences in the way the, the waves strike the, uh, the coastline breaks off these sea cliffs and leaves these sea stacks. Now eventually those sea stacks will be eroded away as well and you can already see how this coastline is beginning to be uh, straightened to some degree and this is another uh, uh, photograph from Australia. 
So this is how that selective erosion occurs. Coastal erosion tends to produce a smooth shoreline. So um, shorelines are smoothed out and straightened by coastal erosion. Wave energy converges on headlands. Again, we're going to talk about refraction of waves, but it tends to bend them into headlands. And so you get wave energy focusing on both sides of the headland, um, and then it um, tends to be less in the, in the bays. So the accumulation of sediment derived from the headland in the bays eventually smooths the contour of the shoreline. So you can see a headland eventually turns into these sea stacks, and as those beaches uh, deepen and thicken, the entire coastline straightens out. So marine erosion is usually most rapid on high energy coasts, frequently battered by large waves. Low energy coasts are only infrequently attacked by large waves. So, um, coasts can also be shaped by land erosion and also sea level change. So, sea level change may actually cause um, sea level to rise up into what used to be some deep canyon or, or where a river has cut down to the sea. And in those situations, you get what are referred to as drowned river mouths. So, we talk about Sydney Harbor, but uh, much better examples of drowned river mouths are the Delaware and the Chesapeake Bay in the Hudson River Valley, where sea levels have come up and literally drown uh, old rivers that had cut down through the uh, continent. And then fjords are deep, narrow bays, uh, and they're also formed by tectonic forces and then later modified by glaciers that, that move down and erode the valleys into deep U-shaped troughs. And then as sea level comes up, it drowns those U-shaped troughs, and you get these deep, narrow fjords. So we'll talk a little bit about beaches. We uh, showed you how uh, sea cliffs can be eroded away and beaches develop in, the, in more tranquil bays. And so a beach zone, or a beach, is a zone of loose particles that cover a shore. Uh, beaches dominate depositional coastlines. So when it's erosional, you're, you're seeing the uplift and the battering, but as that, the character changes to a depositional coastline, that's when you start to get beaches. And beaches occur when sediment, usually sand, is transported uh, to places suitable for deposition, meaning it's moved there and then it's able to uh, fall out of the medium, moving it, mostly water, sometimes wind, and be stable. So we have some unique features of the beach, including the berm, the berm crest, the back shore, the first foreshore, the beach scarp, longshore trough, and the longshore bar. So um, the back shore is what's going to be up against the dunes, and the foreshore is going to be what separates the back shore from the actual water itself. The near shore is going to be those, uh, the breakers and the offshores just out beyond where the breakers are. And the wave action uh, tends to create these berms and berm crests along the beach and, and, and beach scarps. And the beach scarp is where maybe high tide comes up to. And so it erodes away up to that point and it leaves a little bit of a small cliff in the sand. And you've seen that at our local beaches at times. Um, in the summertime, you don't see it as much as you see it in the wintertime. And then the way water uh, pulls sand back off the ocean, you tend to get these longshore bars. And these longshore bars are very important because if you listen to media talking about beach and boating conditions, oftentimes they want to talk about the, um, the rip current threat. And, and rip currents literally occur where these longshore bars are cut out by waves. And when we talked about waves, we talked about longer period waves being able to feel the bottom earlier. So if you have a very short period wind wave, these waves just sort of move over these longshore bars and break on shore. But if you have a much longer period wave that fuels the bottom earlier, those wave circles, those epicircles, will, will tend to erode and break out these longshore bars. And so what happens is you get a bar that's sustained and then an area where it's broken out because of a, a longer wavelength of waves. And what happens is water gets pushed up the beach and tends to rush out in that break. And it's in that break in the longshore bar where you tend to get your rip currents. All right, so um, depositional coastline, low energy. This is a, you know, what we basically think of as a beach, and this happens to be yet another picture from Australia, uh, but you can see that uh, you've got calm waves and uh, seawater that pools in the back shore, and it's a very, very calm and settled environment. And that's going to be a depositional coast. Your erosional coast is going to be the cliffs and the battering, breaking waves, a lot like what you see in parts of Hawaii, a lot what you see in California, and uh, the New England coastline north of, uh, of Boston. All right, beach profiles. Flatter beaches, the flatter the beach, the finer the material from which the beach is made. So 
Uh, if you have very, very fine <clears throat> powder sand beaches, you tend to get nice wide beaches. And we think about uh, that on the Gulf Coast, particularly um, some Gulf Coast beaches, uh, the Panhandle, where you have more uh, larger particles. You think of the, uh, the beaches you might see on the East Coast or even down in the Keys. So the flatter the beach, the finer the materials from which the beach is made, large particles tend to form steeply sloping beaches, and fine particles tend to form gently sloping beaches. Now, beaches are cut to a lower level in the wintertime because of more wave energy. Wintertime tends to have more storms and more waves, um, and then gentle summer waves, summer waves tend to move sand on shore, uh, while larger winter waves tend to pull sand offshore and expose that, that, that uh, rock at the basement. All right, longshore drift. Um, so wind-driven movement of sand along an exposed beach and the current-driven movement of sand in the surf zone just offshore creates what's known as longshore drift. And essentially, the waves are going to come in at an angle and the sand is going to move up with the water and then the move comes straight back down. Uh, so you basically are taking sand from here and moving it up the beach and then it comes back down. And sand from here up the beach and comes back down. And in the end, you tend to create this longshore drift. The movement of sediment, usually sand, along a coast by wave action is called longshore drift. Longshore drift occurs in two ways, wave-driven movement of sand along the exposed beach, which I just described, and the current-driven movement of sand in the surf zone. So this is the current moving sand uh, up the beach. Um, the longshore current moves sediment along the shoreline between the surf zone and the upper limit of wave action. So from about here, uh, back to about here, sand is moved, and that is that longshore current. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about coastal cells and how coastal sediment is um, is moved within a coastal cell. So I've got a couple of pictures here. You've got the uh, red lines or submarine canyons. That's going to be where maybe a, a river comes out uh, and cuts a valley in the land, and then also a canyon on shore. And then you got your longshore drift, which you just talked about, the drift of sand along the coastline. And then uh, you can see where you have rockier headlands. So the general features of coastal cells, sand is introduced by rivers and then transported, in this case, southward by the longshore drift and then trapped within the nearshore heads of submarine canyons. So a section of coast in which sand input and sand output are, are balanced is referred to a coastal cell. It's an area where... There's enough coming in and enough going out that the entire thing remains in balance. That's going to be your coastal cell. If sediment gains and losses are about equal, the nearshore system is in equilibrium. If losses exceed gains, as shown here, the beaches within the cell will shrink and possibly disappear. So you can see in that uh, where you have that uh, river, um, you're getting sand coming down and it produces beaches to the south. Uh, but if there's less coming in than is being taken away, those beaches will disappear. Coastal cells are usually bounded on either side by submarine canyons that move sediment uh, to the deep sea floor. All right, let's talk about the larger scale features that accumulate on a depositional coastline. So Florida in the southeast is a depositional coastline. Some of the features that we have are sand spits, inlets, barrier islands, uh, lagoons, sea islands, tombolos, and also deltas. So here's a kind of a view of all of those things. The longshore current is going from left to right in this picture, uh, and because it's going to move sand from left to right, you're going to have a couple of interesting features. First off, that longshore current in the upper left corner pulls sand across that open bay, and eventually um, a sand spit forms. Now, a little bit further down to the second bay, you can see where that sand spit uh, has uh, developed in what's called a bay mouth bar, and it's almost closed that bay off, and there you have a an inlet. Um, you also see where sand moving down the, uh, the coastline has created a barrier island. Uh, the one barrier island has also created a lagoon, and then where there's a sea island offshore, a little tombolo has formed where sediment drops and creates a little land bridge from the coastline out to the sea island. So, Sand spits form where the longshore current slows as it clears a headland and approaches a quiet bay. So when the water slows down, the sediment falls out. A bay mouth bar forms when a sand spit closes off a bay attached to a headland adjacent to the bay. So the bay mouth bar is where it just completely closes off the bay. 
depositional coasts can also develop narrow exposed sandbars that are parallel but separated from land known as barrier islands and the long shallow body of seawater isolated from the ocean is therefore then known as a lagoon. Barrier islands then are narrow exposed sandbars that are parallel but separated from the land. They can form when sediments accumulate on the submerged rises parallel to the shoreline. So those, those longshore bars, if they get big enough, they can create the barrier island. The lagoon develops back behind the barrier island, a long shallow body of seawater isolated from the ocean, and then sea islands, somewhat different, they're a composite structures that contain a firm central core that was part of the mainland when sea level was lower. So essentially a sea island is going to be where uh, when sea level was lower, it was actually part of the mainland, but as water came up, it drowned all the land around it and just left the sea island. So it's got a strong rocky core, essentially, that holds the sand in place. Now, going back to the barrier islands, barrier islands are, are uh, those exposed sandbars, and if they get uh, anything that grows on them that puts down roots, it helps to hold the sand in place and barrier islands form. But the natural process of a barrier island is, it to for, is for it to form offshore, and then over a period of time, when large sea waves occur because of storms, uh, the sea waves will actually wash over the barrier island, moving the sediment from the front of the barrier island to the back of the barrier island. And in that way, barrier islands that are not developed are actually will migrate back toward the coastline. And we can see that along the east coast of the United States in areas where we have um, developed barrier islands and put up seawalls and put up jetties and whatnot. The barrier islands stay static. It doesn't move. But barrier islands that have not been um, developed, they'll actually move toward the coastline. And that's the natural process of a barrier island. And so that's the way that looked. This is something specifically that's happened in Maryland with um, the uh, uh, Ocean City Island. Barrier island has been developed, and the island to the south of it hasn't been developed. And you can see where the position of the shoreline was in red in 1849, and when this particular study was done in 1980, uh, how far that uh, that southern island had moved because of the natural processes. So the natural process is the barrier islands can form when rising sea levels cause the ocean to break through dunes, lining the ancient coasts and lagoons form, such as the Indian River Lagoon. Um, as sea level continues to rise and ocean waters wash over the island, depositing sand in the lagoon, barrier islands tend to migrate landward. Um, and this situation can be enhanced if the barrier island is sediment starved. And so because of the because of the jetties that were built on Ocean City, that barrier island was starved of sediment. It, sediment couldn't get to it, and um, essentially it caused that, that island to migrate westward. All right, deltas like the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, sediment washing off the land can build up the coast at river mouth, and these features are called deltas. Deltas do not form in every river mouth. Um, you have to have a continental shelf, a broad continental shelf present with a low tidal range, meaning not a lot of water moving back and forth and weak waves. Because if you have a lot of water moving back and forth and big, huge waves, all that sediment's going to just get washed away. But where you have a broad continental shelf, low tidal range, and weak waves, you're going to get a big delta forming. Uh, and the shape of the delta is a function of the balance between the accumulation of sediment, how much sediment is it's coming in from the river, and then how much is root removed by the ocean. And those different um, situations create different delta shapes. So river-dominated deltas, such as the Mississippi River, are, are fed by strong river currents um, that terminate in what are known as distributaries. You've probably heard the term dis uh, tributary. A tributary river is the smaller rivers that feed the larger river. So a distributary is when a larger river feeds the ocean when it comes to its terminus. And the distributaries tend to branch out like a bird's foot, and you get those, uh, those deltas that we think of like a triangle. And those are uh, river-dominated deltas. A tide-dominated delta is when tidal currents literally overpower the river and move um, inland. So the Mississippi River is always flowing south, but in a tide-dominated uh, river, the tide actually pushes up the river. Um, and that typically results in a series of islands that are parallel to the river flow. Um, Wave-dominated deltas are smaller, where the river flow is overpowered by wave action, uh, and you only get one main channel. So three basic different types of, of deltas, um, and of course the Mississippi River is going to be that river-dominated bird's foot type of delta that's actually in the shape of a triangle. So coasts 
are formed and modified by biological activity as well. Lots of processes go into um, forming and modifying the coast. One of those processes is going to be biological activity. So where do we find the most dramatic modifications? In the tropics, where corals grow, uh, coral polyps grow, and they form reefs around volcanic islands. So the volcanic island, the volcano pokes up from the, the, the under the sea, and suddenly you have land above sea, uh, and then over time, corals will develop what are known as fringing reefs around that island, and you get these uh, you get these coastlines, these new coastlines that are created. So you have them created around islands, but you also have uh, biologic activity around the margin of a, of a continent. Southwestern Florida has been extended um, and, uh, and shaped by the activity of mangroves, where mangroves are plants that can grow in brackish water, and as they grow out, their roots hold sediment and sand in, and the land literally moves out with the mangroves. And so the coastlines have been shaped by that, and, and the mangroves, as they go further and further out, extend uh, extend that. Uh, so uh, biologic activity in lots of different ways can help to form a coastline. So here's the example of the fringing reef. So you got your little island that has popped up and you have your fringing reef. Uh, and then as that island begins to be eroded away in B, uh, what you get is a, an atoll oftentimes. Well, an atoll forms eventually. You get a barrier reef, which is around the smaller island. And then once that island is completely eroded away, then you get your atoll. So a coral reef is a linear assemblage of calcium carbonate created by multitudes of corals. So corals are the individual little polyp animals. They create uh, the calcium carbonate shell around them, and that's the actual coral. So you first you get the corals right along the coastline. That's going to be your fringing reef. Um, as the island sinks, uh, and that's largely from erosion, but also, as we talked about in tectonics, the ocean plate on which it rides is moving away from the spreading center, and so it's getting deeper and deeper. Remember, the, the mid-ocean ridge is at a higher, let's say, seafloor elevation, and as it moves away, it gets deeper and deeper. So these volcanoes that are formed close to the mid-ocean ridge, they will eventually sink, and as they sink, they get lower and lower, but as you can see in B, the coral reef just gets higher and higher. It grows up toward the sunlight, so it continues to get higher and higher, and so eventually you get these atolls. Um, so in the case where the island does not sink at a rate faster than the coral organisms can build, you get a barrier reef, but eventually the island will disappear beneath the surface, but the coral remains at the surface, and that's where you get your atoll. And that little picture at the bottom right is uh, an atoll. All right, now we're going to talk about estuaries, um, and uh, estuaries are very important, the uh, location of tremendous amounts of biologic activity. An estuary is a body of water in which fresh water mixes with ocean water. And estuaries can be classified by their origin. We have drowned river mouth estuaries with fjords. We have bar built estuaries, tectonic estuaries. So um, drowned river mouths like the mouth of the James, the York, and the Susquehanna, Susquehanna Rivers, the Chesapeake Bay, Sydney Harbor in, in Australia, those estuaries are where river mouths have been drow drowned by uh, a rise in sea level. Fjords, like in New Zealand, um, and also in the northwest coast of North America in Washington State, the Straits of uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, they are again uh, where those those deep channels are flooded out as sea level rises, and you get, get those very very deep U-shaped um, estuaries. And again, the U-shape has come by some previous glacial advance that carves out that U-shaped channel. Um, bar built, like the Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds um, in North Carolina, where you get barrier islands, and then the lagoon behind them um, becomes, uh, has lower salinity because fresh water flows into it. And then uh, tectonic, like San Francisco Bay, where uh, some down drop because of tectonics. And so if we, if we look at this, this is a situation where we have a divergent coastline. So the red line shows where everything was at one time, but plates are moving apart. So that plate's moving in that direction, this plate's moving in that direction, and it causes this to fall, to sink down, and uh, that creates a bay or, or an estuary like what we see in San Francisco Bay. All right, so this is uh, the range of salinity. So the white is where there's fresh water, and the red is where it's saline and uh, and and this is going to be the Chesapeake Bay, where these uh, tributaries feed the bay with fresh water. 
and you can see how the salinity increases as you get closer and closer to the ocean. So it's an example of a partially mixed estuary. The colors indicate salinity in parts per thousand. The typical distribution of surface salinity in an estuary ranges from 28% uh, at the mouth to about 1% in its upper reaches. So you can see something interesting. The Coriolis effect, or the movement in the northern hemisphere to the right, um, forces the inflowing saltwater against the right or the eastern bank. Uh, and so that uh, higher stripe of 20% contour tends toward the right side of the bank. But that is a, a uh, partially mixed estuary where fresh water flows in and then tidal push pushes salt water in from the mouth. So um, we'll have a couple different types of estuaries and we'll see cutaways of each one. Um, a rapidly flowing large river basically keeps the ocean at bay, and the ocean seawater is going to be denser, so it's going to sink, and so you're going to get this wedge where fresh water lies on top of salt water, and so this is called a salt wedge estuary. Uh, and then you have a well-mixed estuary with slow-moving rivers with moderate to high tidal range, so the high tidal range means that as the tide goes high, it pushes salt water in, and as the tide goes lo low, the slow-moving river pushes fresh water out, uh, and you get this well-mixed estuary. Uh, and then you get a partially mixed estuary, like the Chesapeake. And a partially mixed estuary retains some of the characteristics of a salt wedge and some of the characteristics of a well-mix. It's somewhere in between, and they tend to be slightly deeper estuaries. And you can see there's still a little bit of a salt wedge, but there's also some mixing that goes on as well. And then we have the fjord, and again, in the fjord, the glacier carves, eight, carves out this U-shaped shaped valley, but when glaciers form, they get to a point, they get to a certain point, and at that end point where they stop, eventually when they recede, they dump a tremendous amount of sediment at that end point, and those uh, mounds of sediment are known as moraines, and a terminal moraine is the furthest extent of the, um, of the glacier, and they also leave other moraines back as the glacier retreats, but the terminal moraine is this last one. So as a, a glacier, an alpine glacier, comes down a valley and carves out this U-shape, um, it gets to a point where it stops, that's where it leaves the terminal moraine, and that terminal moraine um, acts as a sill at the mouth of the estuary, and it, it creates this estuary type, this fjord estuary, where you have this layer of fresh water on the top and the layer of salt water on the bottom. So what are the characteristics of the U.S. coastline, something that we should all be able to identify with? The Pacific coast is an actively rising margin where indications of recent tectonic activity can be observed. It's an emergent coastline, all right? Um, the Atlantic coast is a passive margin on the trailing position of the North American plate. So the North American plate is moving off to the north and west, and we're on the southeast corner of it in the, in the Atlantic coast, the eastern corner of it. So we're on the, the trailing portion of it. Uh, so it's a passive margin. And then the Gulf Coast is this enclosed basin, which means it has smaller wave size, but also smaller tidal range. And that's what we get with the Gulf Coast. And also, on the Atlantic Coast, you tend to get uh, two high tides, two low tides a day. But if you're on the Gulf Coast, you only get one. And that's, again, because it's that smaller enclosed basin. The water tends to slosh sort of back and forth over 24 hours in that basin. So humans certainly uh, interfere in coastal processes. Human interference in coastal processes does not always, however, uh, result in the desired, well, the desired result is the law of unintended consequences. Um, oftentimes, human interference is meant to slow beach erosion. You built a $200 million fabulous resort on a beach, and then next year big waves come and wash your beach away. Your visitors don't like that. So what do you do? You build a seawall, or you build a groin, or you build um, uh, any other type of uh, other types of structures that can potentially uh, help to uh, hold your sediment in, hold your sand in, um, like a jetty. Unfortunately, those types of uh, structures tend to starve other areas of the coastline of that sand. So, here is a view of. Sebastian Inlet with the Sebastian Jetty on the north side, and of course the longshore current tends to be from north to south along the east coast of Florida, and um, the, the large long jetty on the north side slows the water down and causes the water to largely dump its sediment uh, on the north side, 
And so you can see how the beach has literally receded on the south side because it is, um, it is sediment starved, and it's sediment starved by that jetty. So the jetty is very, very good at saving the sand on the north side, but it causes a problem on the south side. So seawalls um, tend to protect property, property ter uh, temporarily, but they also increase beach erosion by deflecting wave energy um, onto the sand in front of and beside the seawall. So um, you take any sand that was in front of the seawall away, so there's just exposed seawall, and then on either side of the seawall, uh, sand uh, waves are focused and you pull sand away from that area. So um, that's it's fine. It's fine for the house on stilts, but it's not good for the water out in front of the house and it's not good for the beaches on either side of the house. Also, high waves can then wash over the seawall and destroy them uh, and then the water still gets to the property and you've also destroyed the beach lines. Now, groins are structures that are built perpendicular to the wave action, uh, but they have the same effect as a as a jetty and, and oftentimes, and you see a lot of this in South Florida where you have one luxury hotel after the other, each hotel right on its southern edge will build a groin and you can see how that groin holds sand on the north side and then depletes sand from the south side. So if you built your hotel here, you build a groin, you keep your beach, but the guy who builds a hotel here, he loses his beach, so he builds a groin. So it's a process they do right down the beach. So groins are structures that extend from the beach into the water. They help counter erosion by trapping sand from the current. Groins accumulate sand on their updrift side, but erosion is worse on the downside, the downdrift side, which is then deprived of sand. So groins are good for people who build them, but not good for people uh, downdrift of, of the groin itself. Um, the other thing that humans do is they import sand on the beaches, uh, and it's considered to be one of the best responses to erosion. However, um, of course, eventually that sand is just going to be eroded away. New sand is oftentimes uh, dredge from offshore, so the quality of the sand is not the same as the sand that was naturally there. The sand that's naturally there is going to be more well sorted, it's going to be uh, typically cleaner, uh, and also this can cost tens of millions of dollars. It can disturb aquatic biodiversity, um, and then oftentimes it's going to be finer because um, you get more siltier uh, types of sediments offshore, and so um, which also makes it dirtier, uh, and uh, so it's more easily eroded. So. You know, it, it's easy to see it, it work. You bring the sand in and it works and you have a new beach, but then it, it gets eroded almost more quickly than the previous beach. In chapter 11, we've learned that the location of a coast depends primarily on the global tectonic activity and the ocean's water volume. While the shape of the coast is a product of many processes, uplift and subsidence, erosion, redistribution of material by sediment transport and deposition, even the biological activities of uh, creatures along the coastline. Coasts are classified as erosional, on which erosion dominates, or depositional, on which deposition dominates. Natural rock ridges, tall stacks, sea caves are all found along erosion, erosional coasts. Depositional coasts often support beaches and accumulations of loose particles. Generally, the finer the particle on the beach, the flatter the slope of the beach. Beaches change shape and volume as a function of wave energy and the balance of sediment input and removal and coral reefs and estuaries are among the most complex and biologically productive coasts that you find. And lastly, we talked about how human interference with coastal processes has generally accelerated erosion of coast near inhabited areas. And that, of course, will wrap up Chapter 11. Next, we're going to take a look at the biological activity in the ocean. That's with Chapter 12.